Good morning, friends. Welcome to St. James. How are you today? All right. I'll ask that question again in case you, you know, missed it this time. It's all right. It's all right. It's all good. Oh, it's great to be here with you. My name's Patricia Abel, and I am so blessed to serve as pastor of, of St. James United Methodist Church. Um, you know, we have scriptures in the Bible, and in this uh, document, we find commandments of old lessons from parables that aren't so old as the commandments that but there's even older. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. There's older than the Bible, whether it be the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament. And that is simply what you see. What we see when we look up towards the rising sun, what we see when we look up towards a rising moon, the stars that are in the sky. These are the mysteries of God and the creation of God. The creation of God's work. So whether it's tablets of stone or poetry or a testimony of pressing forward or even a Messiah who predicts how the world will reject him all of these things come together as mysteries of our Creator. Each one is different. Each one has different lessons. And today we're going to look at a couple of those. But here's the question before us. Do we dwell in a house of defeat and despair, or do we dwell with our Redeemer, the liberator of our lives, who promises things we cannot yet see? See, see that's exactly what it is, friends. That's exactly what it is that comes to mind today for me in light of all that has transpired this week, last night, several weeks ago, months ago. So I'm going to invite you into a time of hear our prayer, O oh Lord. How long, O oh Lord, must we endure these challenges to the promises? And I'm going to tell you that my, you know, my soul was definitely hurt when I heard the tragedy unfold at Morgan State University earlier. I can't even begin to describe where my heart went as I learned of the challenges that Israel is facing now, being under attack. And then last night at Bowie State. But it's not just those overt, faraway acts, even though they might just be, you know, a couple miles away. It's the stuff that happens in our families and in our community. Things that we're enduring, some of us silently. Let us give our hearts to God in this moment. Won't you join us, the choir, in singing a prayer, a plea to God. Come and fill our hearts.
Thank you, friends, for joining in that, uh, that poignant moment. It never ceases to fail me how God works. This was selected, you know, days ago. Had no idea. But it was just the right thing for today. And I pray for your heart as well. And so now let's join with Mary Ann Espenshade as she leads us in the call to worship and a prayer of confession. Let's join in the call to worship. Christ, the cornerstone, welcomes us to this house of God. May our minds perceive God's word. Even as our hearts receive God's love, may God's spirit bless us with wisdom and faith. Prayer of Confession. God of grace and God of glory, bless us with your mercy and your steadfast love. When we pursue pointless gains and embark on dead-end journeys, guide us back to your ways. When we strive for our own righteousness, remind us that your righteousness is all we need. When we reject your teachings, or even worse, reject your presence, love us and correct our ways. Forgive us and welcome us home into the arms of your grace and love. Amen. Do not be afraid. God's love is strong enough to overcome our weaknesses. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us stand, embody your spirit, and welcome one another with friendship and peace. And pass a wave of peace to the people worshiping at home. <laughs> and as we stand, let us join our voices together to sing our opening hymn, The Church's One Foundation. Thank mm -hmm.
themselves. And I brought my lunchbox with me. So what do I have? Could I possibly have a treat? Somebody was nice to you just because they wanted something? Never. Well, when that happens, they are using you. And we really should name it misusing. Because that's what's really happening. They're using your relationship in a bad way. Today's scripture passage reminds us that some people misuse God's name. They might tell another person that God will be angry with them if they don't do what they want, they might say a swear word that misuses God's name. They might talk very loudly about how much they love God, just to brag about it in front of others. Do you know what brag means? It means to, like, show off. Exactly. Yep. That's when we're overly proud of ourselves and we want everybody to know how good we are. We think we are. When people act in these ways, they're showing they don't love and respect God. Instead, they're trying to control God, using God's name to get what they want. God doesn't want us to have that kind of a relationship with him. In Exodus, now do you know what Exodus is? <laughs> what? Good answer. What number of the Bible? What? <laughs> it's the second book of the Old Testament, right, in our Bible. And I didn't have time to play a song, but if you look up at home on YouTube, the Ten Commandments Boogie oh, yeah. by Go Fish. I love that. <laughs> It'll give you the whole, the whole Ten Commandments. But today we're talking about the third one. And that's the one that God gave to the Israelites not to misuse God's name. So it's number three, and you only use the name of God with respect. God gives us life and all that we have in this life. God loves us completely. In return, we should honor and love God. That's what God wants. And using God's name in the right way is a real treat. Ooh, uh, that reminds me. <laughs> Got this cosmic brownie right here. Do you have any more? I'm not finished. Oh. Excuse me. <laughs> Remember to give God honor and respect in how you use God's name. Now, would you just bow your heads and while I say a little prayer? God, thank you for loving and caring for us because of who we are. Teach us to honor you and never to misuse your name. Amen. Amen. And now you, you were very good. I'm very proud of you. Most of you. <laughs> so I do have some more treats. You can have this kind, or I have I have little pumpkin cookies, or chocolate chip, yeah, or this brown. one's closer. Okay. Do you yeah. have any more of these? I do. Would you like one? <laughs> you can take. Okay. But there's more of these. You have to be good for the whole serving. Can I get two? Sure. Oh, I see all day. Okay. Can I have the whole day? <laughs> There's one, there's another one here. There's 
no protein in there. Oh, good. I'll, I'll eat the scraps. <laughs> Tanya, you're the one sitting next to her. Okay. <laughs> you and me, girl. You and me. Okay. Ah, I guess I shouldn't have spilled the beans. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to hear two scriptures read this morning uh, that Marianne will share with us. And the first is from Exodus chapter 20. And if that doesn't ring a bell, um, it does include the Decalogue. Decalogue, huh, what's that? I saw that. I saw that over here, too, so you weren't the only one. But, um, yeah, the Ten Commandments, those tablets of stone, um, and how they get delivered to Moses and the people. And then I want you to listen for the people's reaction. All right, so listen to all of the words and also for their reaction. And then we will hear the gospel lesson from Matthew's uh, chapter 21. And remember that, that Ma this part, part of the scripture from Matthew is where Jesus is in Jerusalem. We've already had his entrance. And so he's in the midst of the temple teaching. And uh, the religious authorities of the day, the Pharisees and other legalists, are not very keen on this. They challenge his authority. And today, he shares a very pointed parable with them. So you're invited uh, to listen for that. And I think that's it. That's all I got. First scriptures, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name this way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks. I'll give them a minute to fix the audio. There we go. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the horn and the mountain smoking, the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid because God has come only to test you and to make sure you are always in awe of God so that you don't sin. And the gospel reading is from Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time for harvest, he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed his servants. They beat some of them, and some of them they killed. Some of them they stoned to death. After he sent, again, he sent other servants, more than the first group. They treated them in the same way. 
Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and we'll have his inheritance. They grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They said, he will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a people who produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed and the stone will crush the person it falls on.
Thank you, choir. I can't tell you what a joy it is to sing with all these voices. It's just a true joy. Good morning, friends. Peace be with you. Thank you. How is it with your soul today? Now, today? Yeah, okay. Much better. I'm so thankful for the sunshine. And I don't know, did anyone see the rainbow yesterday morning? Yeah? Okay. It was beautiful. I got to tell you, a certain someone, his name is Chad, sent me a photo yesterday morning of something he'd never seen before. It was a rainbow over the house across the street that belongs to Clarence and Mary Leslie. There was a rainbow over Clarence's house. And I say that, you just never know. You just never know when a sign of God and God's promise will show up. And so I'm happy to be with you today, and I'm so thankful for God's love and for the way you love and serve God's people. Let's pray. Gathered in Christ's name and centered on your word, Lord, help us know your presence. Let our hearts and minds be stirred. Fill us with your spirit, O Lord. Humble our hearts so that we receive the word you have for us this day. Lord, use me to share your story. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. You who are rock, redeemer, and renewer of us all. And all of us say together, Amen. So here's another little fun fact I want to share with you. Yet yeah, that rainbow story is absolutely true. Um, but here's another one. Did you know that there will not be another month of five Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays? for a while. Now, it's not the 824 years that you might have seen on Facebook. No, 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 no. That's a myth. Actually, that might have actually prefer, uh, been more like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing, but here's the thing. It doesn't happen until over a year from now, till December of 2024. It's funny how things kind of capture our attention and we find out they're either true or not true. Isn't it? Yeah. So it's true. In December 24, there will be another month that features Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Five. Five in a row. How about that? I think that's cool. Anyhow, I'm not worried about weekends these days, but back when I was teaching, I would have wanted to know when was the Friday, Saturday, Sunday in a row, how many times did that happen, and how many times was there a Monday that we didn't have to t uh, uh, go to school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still keep track of those things. Anyhow, our scriptures today are also very special, and it would really be very easy to go in depth on each one of them, and I'm not going to do that today. But each of them has an important message that I want to highlight in the sense of us, who we are as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, and the expectations that are set for us by ourselves, by our Lord, and by others. So clearly the passage from Exodus 20 is highly memorable because we have this code of living that it provides. We're taught 
we're told, this is what you do so that you are loving and serving God and God's people. This is how you live in community with me, God, and with you, each other. So you do these first three things, that takes care of our relationship with God. And then the rest of them, gosh, there's so many more, right? Is how we are to live together. And boy, has that been challenged this week. But this is the code for abundant life rooted in God's love. Now, you have hymnals nearby. I saw some of you using them to sing our opening hymn. And boy, isn't that a great hymn, 546. Didn't have any notes, did it? But you knew the tune. I want you to turn in this uh, hymnal and uh, to 700. 50, 750, because in the Psalter section of the hymnal, uh, we have the psalm that was scheduled for today, Psalm 19. And this is, you know, it's really interesting. It's a response to the gift of those Ten Commandments. So you just take a look at it, scan it very quickly if, if you'd like. But I want us to hone in on a couple of certain things. The heavens, right? It starts out with the heavens, God's creation, all before we are God's handiwork, God. Day and night pour forth speech and knowledge. And there's another voice that goes out, and it goes on and on to talk about the mystery of God. And then it gets to the law of God these Ten Commandments that we think of, these, this code for living in relationship with one another and with God. But I want you to focus in on verses 11 through 13, because this is that claim to be close in following these guidelines. This is the claim that you got to stay close to God and living in God's way. Because we've been warned, haven't we, that to break the code of living well with one another puts us in a state of sin. It separates us from one another. And it is offensive to God. But the desire is to be innocent from sinfulness and disrespect. Disrespectfulness that you spoke about, Edie, very important to think about. The word in, in your hymnal is insolence, but it means disrespectfulness, rudeness. And then there's this prayer that finishes this psalm for innocence and clarity. And there are many of us, pastors and lay speakers, who lean on this particular verse, verse 14, as we pray before speaking to God's people. It probably looks familiar. You may have even heard it today. I hope you heard it today. Because I read it today. <laughs> but also in the scripture lineup, and there are always four in our lineup, is a continuation of the letter to the Philippians that Paul has written, the third chapter, verses uh, 4b through 14. You have a Bible in front of you. You're welcome to look it up. Um, but I'm going to talk about it so you you're welcome to follow along if you'd like. So we know uh, several things already because we've talked about it uh, for the last couple of weeks that Paul is writing to this faith community in Philippi from a Roman prison. And the letter starts as a thank you. I give thanks to God for you each and every day and how wonderful you are following the Lord 
and thank you for this care package that you sent to me here in prison, because frankly, friends, that's the only way people in prison at that time lived. There were no cafeterias. There was, you know, there wasn't an exercise yard. There's nothing like we have in uh, the systems today. But we also know that Paul chose to write words of pastoral encouragement to this specific congregation because they were discerning who could be in and who should be out of this thing that has become to be known as Christianity. Yeah, they were trying to figure out particularly how do we live as as a, a Jewish people who are now following Christ, which is a departure from tradition. So they're trying to do a new thing in following Christ in this new covenant. And yet, for those who were Gentiles, that is not Jewish, there was this requirement to be circumcised. That was a sign of the covenant that was given to Abraham. And so they had to decide, do you have to, do you have to do this? Do you have to become Jewish to be a Christian, a follower of Christ? It was a big, big issue. There was even a council of Jerusalem where Paul and Timothy come in and meet with James the Just, the brother of, of Christ, and Peter and John, and they had to figure all this out. Bottom line is, no. To follow Christ, we follow by faith. That's the basic teaching of Paul. Change the world. Transform. Christianity. And so the sign of the covenant is what Jesus instituted, and that is baptism. That anointing with oil, the Holy Spirit sealed in your forehead, in your heart, in Christ. Baptism is the established sign of the covenant. So circumcision becomes uh, more of a medical procedure and a traditional procedure, perhaps, uh, but not a requirement in the Christian faith. But I want you to hear what Paul writes as he addresses this difficulty. In verse 7, he says, Watch out for people who do evil things. Watch out for those who insist on circumcision, which is really mutilation. We are the circumcision. Now think about that claim. We are the ones who serve by God's Spirit. We are. We are. We are the covenant that is living. We're the living covenant. We are living stones, as Peter would tell us in his writings. So for Paul, he goes on to talk about himself. And i got to be frank and honest with you. Paul and I have had a very distant kind of relationship. I did not get this guy at all. He was like, it was like reading Greek that I could not understand. But the more I have grown closer to Paul's writings, the more I get it. The more I get it. Because he talks about all of these assets that he has, and I always read those as like, you know what, you're kind of boasting and bragging. Here comes that message again. But no, he lists all those things. If you're looking in the, in the Bible, you know what I'm talking about here. And he says this, these things were 
my assets. So he gives all this list of identity issues and why he is a stalwart, faithful Jew, faithful in this. His social status is this. And he says, these things were my assets, but I write them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. In Christ, I have righteousness that's not my own and doesn't come from the law, but comes from faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to write, the righteousness I have comes from knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death so that I may perhaps reach a goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I've already th I'm already there. I'm not already perfect. Nope, nope, nope. But he goes on to say, but I pursue it so that I might grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. I forget about the things behind me and I reach out for the things ahead of me. You see, for Paul, as I have struggled to know Paul and understand, I understand now what matters is faith in Jesus Christ. I understand it differently now than I used to. And so as a faithful follower of Christ, we, friends, are called to live differently. We're called to live as Jesus showed us the way to live, in loving God and loving others as we love ourselves. And we must love ourselves so that we are healthy. so that we can be the love that we are called to be, to embody. This is what it means to bear fruit in Christ. It's by how we live, by what we do, by how we put our faith into action. So if we think about the Gospel of Matthew, you don't kind of get those flowery words, but you do get a sense of living rightly. Because here we have Jesus again speaking in conflict with those around him, the, the religious authorities of the day. And it's in the final week of his life. And if you listen carefully, I'm sure you heard the metaphors of this parable. We know parables are not exactly true, but they are exaggerate things to prove a point, to give a lesson. And so, um, to be extremely clear with you, there's this vineyard, right? And it is representative of the people of Israel. And that's not a new idea. We hear that in the prophet Isaiah's writings and teachings, starting in his fifth chapter as he speaks of the vineyard. But the tenant farmers are those, maybe you guessed it, they are the religious uh, legalists and Pharisees. And then there's the son of the landowner. Anybody want to take a stab at who that might be? Yeah, that's Jesus. Yep, yep. And this practice of leasing out field is very common in the first century of Palestine. In fact, it's still employed these days. In the first century, the tenant would give a percentage uh, of the crop as payment for use of the land. Um, and so you have this way of working that is, well, the tenants refuse to do what their contract supposedly said to do, right? And every messenger is killed, even the son of the landowner. 
thinking we can keep the inheritance for ourselves. Huh. I don't think it really works out that way, does it? But let's not get mired in the details of a parable. Let's look at the bigger picture. That in Matthew's gospel, producing fruit is a common theme across. It starts early in, in, um, in the seventh chapter. Uh, talking about a good tree and the good fruit and a bad tree and the bad fruit. In chapter 13, you get that whole discourse on with a parable of sowing seed. And in verse 23, we hear a specific reference to the good soil bearing much fruit. And so it begs the question, not only whose house are you living in, and how do you live according to the rules of that house, but it asks us to ponder this question today. What is the fruit that we're expected to bear as disciples, as the body of Christ? As a faith community, what do we have to show for our work in building God's kingdom? How does your life bear fruit for God's realm? And what do you contribute to the harvest of God that Jesus describes? These are some of the reflection questions at the, uh, on, in your worship guide that I pray you take home and ponder this week. What I want you to hear about is how we mark and measure bearing fruit. Annually, in the church, we celebrate the work that we have undertaken in sowing seeds and harvesting, nurturing growth and bearing fruit in mission together. This year, and you may have seen this in the swirl of announcements uh, before service began, this year the annual church conference is on Saturday, October 14th. That's at the end of this week. It is on Zoom and is, can be done in person. So we will have the conference room uh, and the camera set up so that we can participate together. Or you can participate from the comfort of your home or your spinning wheel or even from your horse, if, you, if you're so called. In any case, in this one hour, one hour and 15 minute meeting, we will spend time in worship with other sibling churches. We're gonna pray and hear word and have a moment of reflection on how we're called to transform the world. And then we will tend to the ordering of our lay leadership, compensation for your pastor and affirm the care of members and affirm our lay servants. And we have a celebration of three cert certified lay servants, and we've got, we've got one more coming up. I'm excited to be able to, to share with you. Um, so come Saturday and find out who. In addition, um, we are also, if you haven't noticed, we're engaged in a time of stewardship. So you may have received a response request through email, through your seashell, and in the e-messenger, um, because this form needs your input and uh, your response, uh, asking you how you plan to support the goals and missions that this church is setting forth. These forms indicate your level of generosity and commitment to supporting worship and nurture and mission of St. James. And interestingly enough, our theme for this year is bearing much fruit. So please, please keep that in the front of your mind also if you have not already turned yours in. And we have received several, uh, but we know it's early. You have through the end of this month, please, to, to really discern 
your generosity level of giving. Friends, the fruit of discipleship is what is produced as we embrace the mission to participate in transforming the world we live in by transforming ourselves, by engaging in worship and devotion and study and living in action and nurturing one another. Should not our lives be lived in the pattern of Christ who transforms lives and bears fruit? Paul writes about these too. And you might remember them. There's love, joy, and peace. There's patience and kindness and goodness. As well as faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these spiritual fruit of the Spirit. So again, I ask, what does this say about how we engage with God's people inside the church and beyond in the community? Friends, it's my prayer that we embody the mind of Christ step by step, day by day, loving and serving God and God's people. May it be so. Amen. Now let us join with Marianne Espen Shade in a time of prayer for God's people, church, and the world. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Loving God, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who are sick or in trouble. Heal their disease, relieve their distress, and return to them the joy of salvation. Loving God, hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer the violence of war or natural disaster. Bring an end to violence that destroys human flourishing. Help us to live in peace with our neighbor and enable us to dwell in harmony with the earth. Loving God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for children and for all who depend upon the support of others protect the vulnerable, shelter the weak, and give strength and wisdom to those who care for them. Loving God, hear our prayer. We pray for elected officials and for civil servants. Stir up in them a desire for justice. Enable them to fulfill their responsibilities with integrity and drive from them any spirit of selfish gain. Loving God, Hear our prayer. We pray for pastors, teachers, and all the saints who lead your church. Grant them wisdom to know your truth and give them courage to live as faithful disciples of Jesus. Loving God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving God, you have covered us with steadfast love and mercy. Receive our prayers and help us to trust your goodness. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Now let's join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us Lord. from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, the glory, glory forever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, God is unfailing in blessing and in love. And so with thankful hearts, let us offer up to God a portion of what we receive from God. And let us sing together as we receive the offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <coughs> And this week it is number, number 94. Number 94. Mm -hmm. number 94. Mm -hmm.
Blessed one, bless those who receive these gifts. Bless our words, our actions, that they may be blessings for your world. Bless everything in our lives and in this time, even as you strengthen this community of faith and the ministries of this church. May it be so, in God's people's sake. Amen. Amen. Now let us join our voices together in body and in spirit for our closing hymn, Christ has made this sure foundation. This is hymn number 559 in the red hymn. <laughs> So friends, if you'll tune in to the uh, benediction before you on the screens or in your worship guide, uh, let us join in this response of sending forth to remind us of our task, our mission, the opportunity we have. Friends, you are the light of the world. We will shine with love as the stars shine with glory. You are the light of the world. We will reveal God's brilliance in word and deed. And as we move forward with what lies ahead, we will press on toward the goal of love. So let us go, shining bright, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to share our faith, to offer prayer, and gather hope wherever we may go.
And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Nothing, nothing, nothing. 